commodity super cycle is just beginning with metals demand to skyrocket. Before I share my favorite metals in this commodity super cycle, which I believe has already begun, I've actually put together a short little video from a range of interviews that Goldman Sachs Jeff Curry has done. And so let's just cut to that video and then we'll come back and I'll share what metals I'm bullish on and why I'm bullish on those metals. Check this out from Jeff Curry from Goldman Sachs. He says, there is no money in this sector Severe lack of investment capital into commodities. 299 out of 300 billion out of inflows last year went into ESG funds. Only 1 billion into commodity funds. Climate change laws are not making the flow of investment capital possible. I've been talking about this for a long time. And uh, Chris McIntosh from Capital Exploits uh, has done a lot of wonderful work in this space. Uh, talking about the whole ESG climate change movement and what it's going to mean just for our living standards moving forward. Oil price is a huge part of the inflation story. And joining us right now is Jeff Curry. He's Goldman Sachs Global Head of Commodities Research. And Jeff, you had called this kind of super spike that we've seen in commodities from a couple of years ago. Um, since that call, commodities have been up incredibly sharply. I think one of the indexes that tracks all these commodity prices is up about 125%. Does, does it continue? Absolutely, yes. So do not look to commodities in providing any reprieve um, to these inflationary pressures. The only way you solve this problem is through increased investment to grow supply. Um, and at right now, the capital availability is just not there. There's a capital deficit in these markets. Like I say, it's not about the supply and demand of the barrels of oil. It's about the supply and demand of the capital used to create those barrels of oil. And whether if it's capital markets retreating because of ESG constraints or credit through bank lending retreating because of, you know, leverage ratio constraints. Um, at this point right now, this market is severely constrained of capital. And you can see the implications. No investment in terms of, you know, greenfield capex or any type of longer term capacity expansions you don't see the investors in these markets you see liquidation of financial positions and liquidation of inventories across the board um, and you think about this market is twice as high as where it was over a year ago so it needs twice as much capital and it does not have that capital so this is a very serious problem that's probably like and I also want to point out right now today you're at the weakest point in time we have covid pressures in in china that are likely to be temporary, and you have the SPR, which is temporary. These are not long-term solutions to a structural problem. They're much more temporary. Following yesterday's uh, slide, and we see that's resuming today. We're uh, closing in on 100 from the other side. Brent and U.S. Uh, crude bo both falling. Prices falling after a uh, Russian top negotiator called peace talks with uh, Ukraine constructive. Joining us now is Jeff Curry, Goldman Sachs. Uh, global head of commodities research. Is that it, Jeff? Or is it, I, I think now it's almost binary. It's what happens in, in Shanghai versus what happens with, uh, with, with Russian oil. I guess it's both. You got supply on one side, demand on the other. And they're, they're, they're sort of offsetting each other and, and whatever becomes a more front and center in traders' minds seems to dictate where the price goes. Absolutely. You know, for rightly or wrongly, I think the big sell off we saw yesterday was driven by COVID concerns, particularly the lockdown in Shanghai. But I think you, your point is you got the offset of what's going on in Russia. I think the key point here is COVID demand disruptions are transient, while the supply disruptions are far more persistent. Why? Because you're not investing in Russian production capacity, which is going to impact supply further on down the road. So the net of this, you know, it's still very bullish. We view this pullback as being a buying opportunity. You know, we stick to a near-term target of 120 and an end-of-year target of 135. Um, and I think, you know, one of the key points here is it's not about so much the supply and demand of the commodity itself. It's about the supply and demand of the capital used to create this commodity. And these markets are really facing a liquidity crisis, whether if it's the financial markets, whether it's stocks, bonds, credit, whatever it might be, and even the commodity itself. Liquidity is collapsing at a time it really needs this liquidity. Since the, uh, the incremental 
uh, wild card is is Russian oil, and and that's not what is it? What, I don't know how many barrels out of ten the world is. Is it one out of ten, something like that? So so it is important. What's happened in in the last three weeks to a month? I mean, initially it was still flowing to some extent. You, maybe you had to sell it at a discount, but then you know we read about things taking hold over time. How much is it depleted at this point, what Russia is supplying to the world? What, where are we? How, much, how far down is it? And, and what is that likely to, to, to look like a week from now, a month from now, three months from now? I mean, the bottom line, we put the disruption somewhere right around 1.4, 1.5 million barrels per day, call it one and a half percent of global supply. So it's modest. And um, when we think about the areas where you can get a disruption, all the pipelines are flowing. Um, in fact, you have more oil going down the pipelines and more gas going down the pipelines today than you did before. The disruption is in the Black Sea because um, that's where the ships go out. That's where the problem is. Now, there's two disruptions. There's the ones that are associated with Russia specifically, which is where that 1.4 million barrels per day comes from. But then there's the more recent disruption um, there in the Caspian um, of the CPC pipeline coming out of Kazakhstan. It was due to mishaps uh, on the pipes. That's another, you know, potentially another million barrels per day, but it's likely to be very, you know, temporary. So I think the key one to really watch here is what's happening to loadings in the Black Sea. Um, which, by the way, they popped up yesterday morning. I'm not going to read anything into it, uh, but you know, overall, you know, call it a one and a half percent disruption to global supply, which, hey, that's meaningful. So let's talk about this. Tomorrow, Jeff, you've got a number of big oil CEOs going to be dragged up in front of Capitol Hill and, and, and yelled at basically by Congress about higher gasoline prices, whether it's justified or not. I'll leave that up to our audience. Who knows? Uh, but I guarantee you I know what they're going to say. They're going to say, listen, we lost a bunch of money for years. Uh, now we're making some money, but there's a structural deficit. How much of what's going on in oil and gas markets right now, Jeff, is caused by years of underinvestment? Some of it, by the way, self-inflicted wounds, but a lot of it based on regulatory and policy issues, which, without trying to get too political, simply make it harder. Like we just talked about ESG with Calsters earlier in the program, harder to get any money to build new projects. Yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. You know, the term we give it is the revenge of the old economy. This problem dates back yep. to 08, 09, when we saw capital redirected to the new economy, choking off the investment that needed to be put in place going back for at least a decade to grow the underlying supply base. So not only oil, gas, metals, agriculture, the entire old economy. And let's not forget, banks are old economy as well. And so they don't have the capacity right now to expand the capital required to grow the supply base. Now, let's think about this. A year ago, oil was called $50 a barrel. Today, it's $108. Um, that's twice the amount of working capital this industry needs today than it needed a year ago, which makes it really difficult for everything to operate. And as a result, inventories are being drawn down, which puts upward pressure on on prices. Liquidation of financial positions like our markets, these, you know, take... Brent, WTI, the overall open interest is just collapsing right now because there's not enough capital in the system to support it. Then you take what you're talking about on ESG, you create a really tight supply situation. And I want to point out, demand destruction is not a long-term solution. The only long-term solution here is getting capital into the markets. Yeah, you know, and Jeff, there was a report out by your own company, obviously on the stock side. I don't know if you saw it about EV adoption and hybrid adoption by 2040. And my colleague Pippa Stevens wrote a great story about it yesterday. And it, and it talked about how, you know, 50% of the market in the U.S. is going to be EVs or plug-in hybrids by 2040. I actually thought the, the story in the report from Goldman was very bullish oil because if 50% of the market is part of that is plug-in hybrid, which means you're still using fuel. And it also meant that the other 50% of the fleet in the United States is still going to be a traditional internal combustion engine, not to mention India, China, emerging markets. They just want a little bit of what we had 30 years ago. The demand curve for oil longer term still see, I know people don't want to hear it, but it seems strong. It. No? Absolutely. And here's the problem is policies asymmetric. It's focusing on management of demand as you just you know pointed out with EVs and it's not even focusing on how do you wind down the supply 
of these hydrocarbons. And what we're seeing, ESG is just doing a blatant reduction of capital availability, which reduces the supply, yet they have this longer term demand outlook that 2040, as you point out, and it creates these massive imbalances that we're witnessing today right now. And it's gonna take years to dig out. And again, I'm gonna emphasize, it's an old economy problem. It's just not an oil and gas problem, which means, you know, you think about how do you stall, solve any type of physical constraints on economic growth? You have to grow the underlying supply base. And I think that's the critical message here. And the only way you're going to get capital into this market is through higher prices. The way I think about it is these markets are screaming, give me capital, give me capital. They're going to keep going higher and higher and yeah. higher until finally capital flows. Is this a regime now of higher prices? I hate to use the word because we've used it in the past. Is this a super cycle? Hey, for, we've been forecasting a super cycle now since October of 2020. So, you know, more than 18 months into this. So this is not something new. We've been in it for a while. But I think the investors need to wrap their head around that we're only beginning here. This is not the end of it. And, you know, we look at investor participation. Open interest in commodity markets collapsing, um, investor outflow. We have specs um, position declining. That's in commodities. Equities, energy equities, free cash flow yields tell you they're severely undervalued. In some cases, high as 30%. Bond yields in the energy space widening right now. So the bond, you know, the, 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 the debt credit spreads. Every single measure you look at tells you the investors are going. But as you just pointed out, this is just beginning at this point. And the only way you're solving this problem on a longer term basis, you need to get capital in the space, make investments, be able to grow supply. We can't do this at this point right now due to impediments, whether if it's ESG or people just afraid of the higher prices. The answer to your questions, this thing is just getting started. So I just want to share two quick charts with you. So here we've got the US Commodity Price Index data going back uh, since 1795. And you can see that the commodities do go in these super cycles. And we believe the uh, commodity market uh, bottomed in 2016. And these cycles usually go for around 30 years. So when we have a look at the uh, visual capitalist um, chart here, this is brilliant. I love it. So you can see that the cycle. Uh, usually goes for around 30 years. Uh, now, with about 15 years being the, the uh, trough to peak. So if we think that uh, in 2016, uh, commodities bottomed, then we're kind of looking at around 2030 as being the peak of this commodity super cycle. So we started a, a commodity super cycle in 2016, uh, we believe, and we're still in the early phases uh, or the early phase of that. And, uh, you know, as I said uh, many times before, I believe we're facing an inflationary decade ahead. We've got government policies, whether it's ESG or whatnot, which, is, which has sucked so much capital and investment uh, out of the mining sector for critical minerals that we need just to function in society, let alone uh, continue to grow and uh, increase our living standards. And then you've got the whole electrification of the economy, this so-called green revolution. And you know we're talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of investment into that sector, and they're gonna need a lot of minerals. Uh, so we believe the demand is only going to increase for these critical minerals and metals, and, uh, and and so this inflationary decade ahead, we're going to see much, much higher prices for, for commodities. Um, but let me just go back to that last chart. So the thing to notice is that uh, in these commodity super cycles, they don't go up in a straight line. So if you have a look at the last super cycle that we had, it bottomed around the mid-90s. And you can see it goes up and then there was almost a hundred percent retracement so everyone would have been just you know jumping ship thinking that you know commodities are, are, are crashing again and, and i guess you could say they did but that was part of the cycle you know so just have a look at this chart nothing goes up in a straight line and so i'll argue that we may see commodity prices 
in the next several months, next several years, retrace quite a lot. You'll have spikes up and then you'll have spikes down, spikes up, spikes down. But ultimately, over the long run, I think between now and 2030, we're going to have much, much higher commodity prices. And can I highly recommend you guys, if you haven't read Jim Rogers' book, Hot Commodities, do so. He wrote this in the early 2000s, and everyone is starting to talk about this book again. I've read it many years ago, and I actually reread it about a year or two ago. And I'll probably reread it again because uh, everything he said in this book is either coming true now or there's a lot of similarities with uh, the whole uh, market uh, and what he wrote in this book uh, all that time ago. And even people like Brent Johnson from Santiago Capital, the dollar milkshake man, has been talking about this book uh, in the last several days and weeks. So a lot of people are, are talking about this book. And if you haven't read it, um, I highly recommend it. So one of the basic foundations of economics is looking at supply and demand and when you look at and and so you need to look at both a lot of people only look at one either the supply or only look at demand uh, they don't look at both and when we look at commodities we see that demand right across the commodity sector either maintains its current levels or increases but the Biggest reason why I'm bullish on commodity prices is because of supply. Supply isn't keeping up with demand, and whether that's due to government policy around ESG, uh, which impacts uh, the ability for investors uh, to, to invest into those sectors because they need investment. And there's a lack of investment in the sector, both from an energy point of view, but also the, the metals. And, well, as you'll see shortly, I also believe in agriculture as well. But one of the big things is the push moving to electric vehicles. I talk about the electrification of the economy. And, you know, I've shared my opinions on on that from, a, from an economic point of view. But uh, when you have a look at this, chart from visual capitalists you can see that the demand growth coming from the ev industry whether you're looking at nickel aluminium phosphorus iron copper graphite lithium cobalt manganese manganese these are these are the commodities that i've been bullish on for some time now i have my own opinions on on this whole sector and whether it's good for the environment or not that's a whole nother debate and a whole nother video but I see where the world is moving, especially in the West anyway. And, uh, you know, so this is a, a, a space that I'm investing heavily into. And when we look at the supply side of things, well, we only need to look at uh, the conflict happening around the world at the moment and realize that supply is shrinking. And this is a good chart from Bloomberg that shows the share of Russian exports that go to different uh, destinations so in Europe, UK, China, US, Brazil, Egypt, and Turkey. So whether that's gas, coal, platinum, nickel, crude, sunflower oil, palladium, fertilizer, wheat, aluminium, and steel. So yeah, these are things that are, that I'm bullish on because the supply demand dynamics don't match up. Now, something I've been talking about a lot on this channel is food prices, and now, the Arab Spring of 2011 was for amateurs. The Hunger Games of 2022 will be lit. And I've talked about this and I've warned about this and shared some things that I think people should do and prepare. In fact, this is the video that I did. Forget gold and silver, buy this now. I talked about agricultural commodities. Once again, you just look at the supply-demand uh, fundamentals. And to me, it says much, much higher prices for food and uh, I think that's also going to cause a lot of social chaos so there, there's other flow on consequences and impacts with all of this so I also recently did this video uh, maybe a bit over a month ago uh, silver and copper's asymmetric trade uh, once again just looking at the supply 
dynamics versus the demand. And really, it is an asymmetric trade when you have something that has not had enough investment into creating more supply of something. So you've got restricted supply, but you've got ever increasing compounding uh, demand. Then you get this asymmetric trade where prices uh, rise in a very short period of time. And that's what I personally think we're going to see in both silver and copper, but also these other metals as well. And I also did this video, uh, Art Berman, Gold, Silver and Commodity Boom Ahead. And once again, it's just looking at the fundamentals of this whole sector. And Art Berman is my uh, one of my go-to guys when it especially comes to the oil market. And in this video uh, I did where uh, billionaire Paul Tudor Jones talks about the $173 trillion commodity boom ahead. So this change uh, to this electrification of the economy is going to require a, an investment of $173 trillion plus. Some other analysts have said it's even more than $173 trillion. So that's that's a lot of uh, investment into into a very small, uh, tight sector. And that's where that we get this asymmetric trade from. Also did an older video uh, where Paul Tudor Jones once again says, buy gold, silver, and commodities. Now, I also did this video where I made uh, a $2 million profit on this commodity trade. So uh, Chris McIntosh is also one of my go-to guys when it comes to commodities. Uh, and I highly recommend you guys follow him. Um, because to be honest, if it wasn't for some of his work, I, I would not have made this profit on this commodity trade. And uh, and it was coal. It was uh, it was Peabody. Uh, and in this, I share that I've taken profits on, on Peabody, but I'm still, well, I'm still holding my other positions on coal, and my other positions on oil uh, because of the price that I simply got in at. The dividends that, that it's paying is is just exceptional. I mean, I, I bought some of these coal stocks at 1.8 times earnings. I just got paid a 50, 56% dividend yield based on my buy price. Uh, so, uh, yeah, from a, from a you know, once again, that, that whole investment in this sector, the supply demand long term, I think prices can be quite volatile in both coal and oil in the short term. But once again, for the longer term, uh, I've taken pro uh, profits on, on my Peabody uh, positions, but uh, my other coal and oil stocks, I haven't taken any uh, any profits on, on that. And in my video, my last video of 2021, uh, this is where I had my predictions for 2022. And the, the video was entitled Inflation 15%. Well, we know according to um, Shadow Stats, John Williams, that uh, we're now look We've got CPI anyway at 17%, not not 85 uh, and silver boom for 2022. And in my predictions, uh, I said down the bottom in red, uh, things that I was bullish on, things that I was buying and accumulating uh, was agricultural uh, positions uh, because of the supply demand side of things. And and this was before some of the conflict that, that began. I've been talking about food shortages for, well, going back at least the last 12 months. Uh, copper, you know, once again, I look at what's happening down in Chile and uh, I look at the, uh, the, the investment in uh, copper. You know, a lot of our copper mines that, that produce most of our, you know, supply of, of global copper are very old mines and their lifespan is running out and we haven't invested in new copper mines and so i've shared some other videos uh actually one video where i shared one of my exciting copper explorers here in australia and i think that's got huge upside potential nickel uh talked about it earlier with the uh, ev uh situation uh, i've got two nickel well let me rephrase that i had two nickel positions um well, I've kind of got three, but two main nickel positions. Uh, I've got another stock that's actually got nickel, copper, uh, zinc, which I'll touch on in a second, cobalt. But my two main nickel plays actually sold uh, during that big, big run up with the LME situation. And call it, call it luck or whatever, uh, but when things are going crazy, I sell. 
And when everyone hates a commodity like coal, I buy. You know, coal was just demonized. It's the world's worst thing. Well, cool. I'll buy it. And when everyone wants something, fine, I'll sell it. And so I've sold those two positions. So I do want to buy back into those nickel positions, but it's still not down where I um, want to get in at. So uh, I might do a video and talk more on nickel in the future. But silver, gold, um, oil. So oil and coal for me right now are, are a hold. I think the price is volatile. If if uh, you know, I'm probably more on the sell side than the buy side uh, in the oil and coal space. Um, but longer term, um, you know, at the right price, definitely buys there. And same thing with gas. I put gas in the same position there. But uh, lithium, uh, lithium has had a tremendous run. Uh, right now, it's probably a hold uh, at the right price. Once again, I'll buy back in and, and accumulate more lithium. Cobalt, uh, very similar, uh, done quite well. Uranium, I am bullish on long term, so I'm just accumulating uranium. The price has come back, or some of the some of the stocks anyway have come back into into a nice uh, range for me to buy in. And uh, you know, I I just like it, you know, so it uh, it makes a lot of sense. And with zinc, you know, to elaborate on zinc, uh, a lot of people don't look at zinc, uh, but it remains the fourth largest traded metal uh, by uh, value. Um, it contributes to the profitability of some of the world's major mining companies, so usually a, as a byproduct. And it, it w wasn't too long ago added uh, to the US list of critical metals. Uh, given that zinc is a key ingredient in gal galvanizing steel. So, yeah, the major infrastructure budgets also uh, approve both in uh, Europe, the US, and I think China, I think will underpin the positive zinc market outlook. Um, and, you know, zinc is, once again, it's not on people's radars as one of the key metals to buy. So, uh, yeah, I like it. Uh, rare earths, rhodium, and platinum uh, as well. So these are... You know, these are something that I've been bullish on for some time. Uh, some have moved into a hold uh, position because prices have, have run up and in some occasions taken profits. But uh, I think we're in a commodity super cycle. Uh, I think we're in an inflationary decade ahead. I think the, uh, the change that they're trying to do to our economy uh, is going to require, uh, I think, hundreds of trillions of dollars of investment and while there's, uh, whether it's government policies around ESG or, or conflict, that is going to shrink the supply of the things that we need, these critical, uh, both agricultural uh, commodities, but also these minerals that we need and, and the energy that we need uh, to function as a society, uh, just says to me that... Uh, over, over the longer term now, as I said, well, well, longer term, much, much higher prices, much, much uh, more free cash flow for the miners. And yeah, but as I said, in the short term, uh, prices can be quite volatile. So, uh, you know, if you've got a, um, if you're an investor, you buy low, you sell high, uh, you, you wait and you invest over the business cycle. Uh, if you're a trader, swing trader, that's not what I do. Um, I do trade options. Usually, I sell options uh, for cash flow uh, on fundamental positions, uh, fundamental value positions that I either want to acquire, so by selling naked puts, or I'll sell out-of-the-money calls on stocks that I own uh, to generate some some more cash flow. But that's just me. I'm not a swing trader. So if I say, "Yep, yeah, I'm bullish copper," and copper goes down tomorrow, well. Hey, thank you, Mr. Market. I love it. Thank you. But if you get upset at that, then you're not an investor, you're a trader. So people need to work out whether they're a speculator, uh, whether they're a, um, a a trader, or whether they're an investor, because they're, they're three very different things. And so people just need to work out what they are uh, and you know proceed with, with whatever strategy suits uh, whatever type of investor, speculator, or um, uh, trader or investor you are. So anyway, that's my thoughts. What do you guys think? 
Uh, do you see a commodity super cycle? Do you believe we're in one? Uh, and what commodities are you mostly bullish in? Uh, bullish on. I'd love to see your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. If you like this video, guys, please hit that like button. Really do appreciate it. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all again on another episode of Finance Uncut.